old television show in America called The Love Boat, and that's the only thing we knew about cruises was The Love Boat, which is, you know, kind of corny people hanging out on a boat on vacation, you know, playing shuffleboard. Something that we wouldn't want to be a part of. But Michael Lazaroff, the guy who puts on these jazz cruises, I've done them in America, he asked me to go on a couple of cruises just to see what it was all about. And I got on, on the ship, and I looked around, and uh, I saw very quickly that the ship is just like a hotel. The ship doesn't make anything happen. It's just a nice environment. And what really makes it nice is the people and the musicians. You know, Michael Lazaroff came to me and he said, look, I want you to put together the kind of music that you think would work in Europe for an audience that would be American and European. When they asked me to choose the musicians, I said, well, I want McCoy Tyner and Herbie Hancock. These are the two most influential piano players in right. modern jazz. I'm so happy to have him here. Please welcome Herbie Hancock. All right, thank you. I was a kid, I was probably about 13 years old or 14, and I was in a basement of a friend of mine. You know, we, that's where we used to hang out, you know, and we used to listen to music, you know, and each of us would have albums and we'd challenge each other. Well, you think what you played is cool, but have you heard this? So we were doing that kind of thing. And uh, this guy came downstairs into the basement and said, I got you all today, because check this out. And he put this record on, and the bass went, boom, 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 oh, oh, boom, 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 oh. And we all just stood there with our jaws dropped because we never heard anything that funky. Uh, we thought it was a bass guitar playing it. We never heard a bass guitar sound like that. Well, it turns out it wasn't a bass guitar. It was Herbie Hancock playing on a bass synthesizer. But, you know, synthesizers were new at that time, and we never heard anything like it. And then we were tripping out because we'd look on the back of the album at the instruments that these guys played, and Herbie Hancock, under the instruments that he played, he had listed about 13 instruments, you know, and we hadn't heard of any of them. We didn't know what any of these instruments, what's an arp odyssey and what's a clavinet, you know? What are all these, you know, instruments that he's playing that we've never heard of? And, and the percussionist on that album, he listed every instrument that he played, a shikare and a kabasa, and we didn't know any of these names. So it was like a, a music lesson, you know? And at the same time, our heads are going like this, you know? And in the middle of that song, Herbie went to the Fender Rose and played this incredible jazz solo, and none of us knew anything about jazz. That album, the Headhunters did so many things for us. It made us want to learn about instruments. We wanted to learn what all these instruments on the back of this album were. And we wanted to learn what jazz was, because if this is jazz, we decided that we liked jazz. What makes me impressed about Herbie Hancock is he's a complete musician. You know, he's got technique, he's got passion, he's got imagination, you know? And he, uh, every time he gets on the stage, it's a new story, you know? And I always wanted to be like that with my music as well, you know. When I walk on the stage, it's a new story. Anything is possible. And also, you know, we had that Miles Davis connection. You know, we were very close to him, both of us. And um, to perform with someone who has a similar experience to you is a very nice feeling, too. But it's always an honor to play with him. Herbie called me and said, look, I'm going to put together a group called Headhunters 2005, and I'd like you to play. And I said, oh, no problem. I'm, I'm there, you know. So we got together, and, and Herbie called me before the rehearsals and said, Marcus, do you want me to send you the music to any of this stuff? I said, man, I know this music better than you do. <laughs> and in the band was Terry Lynn Carrington on drums, and Lionel Luecke played guitar, Roy Hargrove played trumpet, and Kenny Garrett played sax, and uh, Munyongo played percussion. You know, Herbie Hancock is one of the only people that became like an icon, you know, he's like a, he was able to sort of crossed a lot of boundaries in music. 
you know, like, uh, he, he reinvented himself, like, uh, a lot of times, you know, and, and always had something to add to the whole spectrum. One of the first things that I noticed that every time he sits at the piano, everyone takes notice because it's always something, some new sound that's gonna happen. Man, I learned so much from Herbie, you know. It's never a dull moment, man. You know, it's always exciting. Uh, on and off the bandstand, he's a very wonderful person, nice human being. Actually, it, it, Herbie turned me on to Buddhism, which was a great step for me. You couldn't really get in a comfort zone playing with Herbie. You have to, you, you couldn't just play your regular stuff that you play all the time. You would have to sort of reach a little bit beyond that into something that you wouldn't normally do. And I think that, it, you know, that's something that he, he talks about during rehearsals and things like that. Don't just play the normal, don't play the two five ones. Don't play the, you know, the stuff you play all the time. Just try to reach for something that's gonna be different and uh, innovative. Well, I met Herbie through the Monk Institute in Los Angeles, um, 2001. I did the audition for the school and uh, it was the judge. Play with Herbie is, uh, you know, it's a blessing, you know, because exactly like Miles, he, he, he won't tell you what to play and how to play it. Basically, it's like if he hire you, it means um, he believe on, you know, he believe on you and he lets you do your thing, you know. So every single, I remember at the beginning, like, what, three, four years ago, when I started playing with him, you know, after the gig, I would go to him and say, man, I call him master. Can you tell me, I mean, anything wrong or anything else? Like, oh, no, man. You know, do your thing. And in three, four years, until now, you know, it happens sometimes, somebody's lost on stage, or Herbie doesn't even raise his head to look at you or whatever. He just keep playing. He's improvising at the same time, he's listening around whatever is happening. If the bass player drop a beat, uh, drop a chord, he join him in a second, you know. The strongest souvenir of the Headhunters 05, well, first was to have, to be surrounded by all those guys, you know? And I really, I felt like I was the baby of the band, you know? And they, they did take care of me, you know? The best souvenir, I remember, it was in the dressing room. In the dressing room was Herbie, Kenny Garrett, you know, Marcus. And the three of, of them was talking about Miles, you know? And one says something, oh yeah, he always say that, you know, like, you know, uh, yeah, you're like talking about your watch or talking about random thing, you know? So I felt like I was, you know, just at that period of when they were with Miles, you know? You move your body in eight notes. That way yeah, yeah, you can't right. go. 
Right. That's is that it? Is that is that? Is that yeah. Oh wait, wait, wait. I heard people like like. Uh, oh, you just count all in once. No, you have to count in halves. You got to count in half. <laughs> Right, right. I was I was just doing it like shit would be on the downbeat. <laughs> 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 be on the upbeat. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> 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 on the downbeat. Yeah, on the upbeat. So I figured, okay, I'll just stand right there. Downbeat. It'll come around. Yeah, right. 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 Too, right? That's that worked like a month. You do a long. Oh yeah, it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I'm doing this with Herbie Hancock. I've got so many questions. I should do it in front of you guys so you guys can benefit. Also, the first thing I want to know: what is the similarities, if any, between the great artists that you've worked with? Can you think of things that you've found are in common between Miles and Dizzy and Joni Mitchell and all the people you've worked with? Is there anything that you can think of that? they all, they each possess? They stand up for what they believe in. Miles stood up for social issues. Um, just the idea of being true to yourself, that's what Miles stood up for. You know, being true to yourself through music. I mean, Miles was, everybody knows he was not a perfect human being, <laughs> you know. He had his, his moments, you know, right, but, sure. but underneath all of his demons, there was this extremely bright, creative human beings, that all he cared about was being providing a, a means by which other musicians could stand up for themselves. And he cared about the audience. He, he cared care about so much that he sacrificed this whole opinion about him, you know, putting his back to the audience and all of that, just to make the music better. The reason for him putting his back to the audience, the same reason that an orchestra conductor puts his back to the audience. He'd face the drummer and get a musical conversation with the drummer. He'd face the bass player, he'd, you know, face the piano. That's all he was doing, just trying to make the music better. You know? he, he would face me when I was in the band. And he started talking to me one time, and I was like, man, I can't hear you, Miles. Because, <laughs> you know, his voice is kind of raspy, and, and the band was loud. And, but I really want to hear, I want to know if I'm, am I flat, am I in the wrong key? But, and finally I heard what he said. He said, how you like my shoes? <laughs> I was like, what, what? Oh, those, those some bad shoes, Mom. And it wasn't usually like that. I mean, what Herbie said is absolutely true, but the one story where he wasn't conducting anybody. He said, what, what size you wear? I can get Cicely to get you a pair if you like them. Man. I was like, okay, Miles, I'm trying to concentrate on this music here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. How you so, like my shoes? How you like my shoes? That's the same thing. You were nice. They were nice serious shoes, by the way. as a heart attack, like, right? Sweating and carrying on and like, yeah, right. Oh, okay, let me relax and look at your <laughs> yeah, shoes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But isn't it funny how But he long... wouldn't say, he wouldn't say, right. why don't you relax? Right. Isn't it funny no, how, he, how long it takes? It out. How long it takes mm -hmm. for you to decipher some of the things <laughs> that he said to you? You know, you're sitting there going. We all have our like, favorite Herbie Hancock moments, but I just wanted to know from you, can you give me a list of the things that really please you that happened in your life musically? Just give, give us a sense of the things that please you in terms of, in terms of your life. Well, the first thing, you know what just popped into my, my mind? It, it was, has nothing to do with the music. Okay. It was the first time that uh, um, 
before I joined Miles' band, but I had already kind of auditioned for his band. And I had one more gig to play. And um, he came down to the village gate to, to listen to me, you know, and, and, um, and afterwards uh, he said, you want to ride back to your place? I'll take you home. I said, uh, uh, Miles, I said, um, I came down in my own car. He said, it ain't a Maserati. Your car ain't a Maserati. I say you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> and so we walked outside, and uh, he saw my little white car. You know, <laughs> he went uh, in his Maserati, and we got to the corner. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and the light turned No, blue. you did not drag race Miles Davis. I got to the next light, lit up a cigarette. I was smoking then. Lit up a cigarette, and then he pulled up. Get out of here. You, you, you toasted Miles? Uh, you burned toasted? him? Toasted? Are you, <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> I was at the next corner before he even moved. What happened? What, what, what happened? He, he rolled down his window, and he said, what is that? <laughs> I say it's an AC Cobra. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> and Miles wasn't he, that he good. Said, <laughs> he said, get rid of it. I said, why? He says, too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tell you that one. Oh, that, thank you, that's, man. That's one of my favorites. Thank I you. I love that. <laughs> I smoked it. It's an AC Cobra. Yeah. Okay. You said a white car. I'm thinking he had like a Datsun, you know? <laughs> wow. Wow. I still have that car today. Oh, yes. This is the car that smoked miles. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the first car I ever bought with my own money. Wow. wow. Yeah. Before that, I, I had one car before that, and it was a car my father bought. But this is the first car I ever bought. And I bought it with the first money I made from Watermelon Man. He's really into odd time signatures. We musicians like to play in 4-4, four, four, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. It's very, very straight. But Lionel plays in 7, in 8. He's got one song in 17. <laughs> so he presented this song to Herbie that's in 17. And uh, it was really difficult to play because, it, you know, as an American musician, you don't feel comfortable as much with uh, odd time signatures. But Herbie figured out a way to take this piece that's in 17 and, and intersperse it in uh, his classic song, Watermelon Man. So there's an arrangement of Watermelon Man that goes from the African beat, it's in 17, into Watermelon Man. It goes back and forth like this. It's really interesting.
you got two kinds of musicians, you know. You have some musicians who, they never make a mistake, and the music is perfect, it's incredible, you know. But you never feel like they're at the edge of their abilities. Why they're always popular musicians, but they don't change people's lives, you know. The musicians who change people's lives are the musicians who, when they play, you know they're at the edge of what they can possibly do, and they might not make it. When I'm playing with Herbie Hancock, you know, he makes, they're not really mistakes, but you can tell that he found himself in a place that he has to find himself out of. You know, he has to work himself out of. He has to solve problems, you know? And uh, that's what makes him incredible. And when you're a musician and you hear him do that, that's when you go, I don't believe he just did that. I think Lenell's uh, musical accent on the guitar, his main influence is from Africa, from Benin, you know? When we first heard him, or at least when I first heard him, I said, oh man, so that's what music is like in Africa, you know? Because it's very complicated and you have to really concentrate. I said, that's what, that's what you guys do in Benin? You know, he said, oh no, they think I'm crazy in Benin also, you know? So although his influence is from home, he's developed his own sound. It's really uh, soulful. It's really complex at the same time, you know, and that's a really hard combination. But uh, he's really interesting, and he's not afraid to try things. You know, he'll play the guitar, and he has these pedals on the floor. You're trying to figure out where is the choir coming from. I hear a choir, you know, and it's coming out of his little boxes on the floor, you know, because he's really good at experimenting with these different sounds and, and different devices that can make different sounds. So um, if you hear us playing and you hear, like, bagpipes or you hear a Bulgarian choir, you hear something and you don't see it on the stage, it's probably going to be Lionel fooling around <laughs> with his instruments down on the floor. My first instrument was percussion. I didn't really choose the percussion because, you know, in Africa, it's kind of in the tradition, you know. It's like you grew up playing percussion. You don't choose playing percussion, you know. My old brother was playing guitar at that time. So the guitar, the other hand, I didn't really choose because that was the first instrument at home I could really, you know, Probably if today I have to start all over, maybe I'll be a piano player or bass player. But the guitar was right there, you know. I play the guitar today and I incorporate the, the, the percussion aspect on the instrument, you know. The percussion playing on my instrument definitely comes natural from my background, you know. My voice on my instrument, it becomes now like one thing. Before it wasn't because it was, uh, I mean, I hate, to hear my voice playing. I used to really hate it because, you know, I would go on the studio recording on somebody's project. And I would be like, hey, yeah, you know, like, be like singing. And I was, I would be like, man, I don't want to hear that, you know. But it gets to the point where it's like getting a trance, getting a, a certain level in my playing that the voice comes naturally and I can't hold it, you know. So I have to deal it. I'm, I don't see myself as a singer at all. I'm not a singer, but I learned a lot from the singer by using my voice to help me play differently. Musician in general, we, we play without breathing, you know, you play, you play, you don't breathe, you know. And you can do that if, uh, uh, if you, you're a singer, you have to breathe, you know. And that's definitely helped my playing. So when I'm playing, I can breathe, I can slow down, you know, take a breath. So, and now I use my voice as a, like one of my pedals, you know, that's how I hear it now, you know, like a, another, another extra pedal. So when I'm playing, the voice is right behind the instrument, you know, so it's part of my playing now.
improvisation is the key at stage. So like what we're doing right now is type of improvisation. I don't know exactly the question you're gonna ask. You don't know the answer I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer and we're not talking at the same time. And even if we do, it means we listen to each other some way, you know. So um, that's all about that's what we play in music, you know. It's like we learn how to play the instrument, like the vocabulary, the language, you know. We speak the same language with different accents, but we understand each other, you know. I'm not from the state, so I still making mistakes speaking English. But the main thing is have a sense of what I'm saying. And I understand what they're saying, so we have the dialogue. And that's what is, for me, it's about improvisation. <laughs> A lot of musicians who say, man, I'm doing stuff for the future, man. This music is very futuristic that I'm doing. And I'll hear it and I'll go, it's very shallow. It doesn't have any tradition to it, you know? And the musicians who went far into the future are the ones who first went deep into the past, you know? They have such a huge foundation. Not to spend your life in the past, but to put in your time when you're young, learning about the history of music, whichever field you're in. I know uh, there's a operatic tenor, who's a friend of mine, his name is Ken Hicks. And I said, man, how do you sing so high? He says, I work on my low notes. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, if I have the most rich, round, low notes, it makes it very easy for me to go high because my foundation is there, you know? And it's the same thing with a jazz instrumentalist, you know? If you know your history and you do it early in your life, that allows you to go. Because you can just take things, there's nothing new. So really, when you're going into the future, you're really just taking this and this and combining it to make something new. 
Well, I met Modesky Martin Wood on the downtown scene in New York City. I did a gig with them at the Knitting Factory, and I was part of their Shack, Shack Man release for their record. And then they was also about to get signed to Blue Note, and uh, they brought me in on that project, which was Combustication. And, um, you know, it was just all improvised, you know. I just came in, you know, listened to what they were doing and just tried to put my expertise in the right places, you know, the right colors and the right spots and being logical. Uh, what surprised me, um, they were just talented musicians, you know, and they all had something special and uh, just sounded so funky, hip, you know, remind me like some of the old records I was listening to and collecting. To Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, you know, so, and it was just funky, you know. Billy Martin, you know, his beats and percussion rhythms are, are like amazing, and Modesky, his, his organ skills and clav skills and piano skills, awesome. And Chris Wood, you know, he's a wonderful bass player. He gets a lot of great sounds out of his bass, and they're just like, you know, a beautiful group to play with, you know. I'd heard a lot of things about this, uh, what they call a jam scene in America. You know, but I didn't know what it was. But I knew that John Schofield was playing in this thing. So I asked him to explain it to me. I said, well, what is this thing called a jam scene? And he said, you know, Pooji, I wish I could explain it to you, but I really can't. Okay, so when a musician tells you, says that, or uses that kind of phrase, it means either A, he's telling the truth, or B, there's a lot of work and he doesn't want to tell you about it. Right. <laughs> so we started talking, and uh, over a six-month, I guess, period of time, you know, so I learned about bands like Soul Live and Martin Medeski and Wood and a lot of these people who make up this music. And uh, I said to myself, well, man, maybe I could do something like this. So basically what we play is um, jazz funk music, and uh, depending on which audience we're playing to, we kind of extend the solos maybe a little more or maybe go a little more of a rock blues direction as opposed to so much a jazz funk direction, depending on where we're playing. But the thing that I, I love, you're playing the young people, you're playing the young hippies, basically, or second generation hippies, you know. So you're playing a lot of colleges and you're playing a bunch of different kind of venues. So that's really cool. And now I find myself in the same position that Schofield was in, and the fact that people ask me about it, and I try to really explain it. It's really hard to explain, you know. But um, for a jazz musician, it really opens up an, a new and a different kind of and new and exciting world. You know what I mean? Because it give, offers you so many more places to play than normally, you know, you wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't hit you think of a, a, as, a, as a jazz thing, you know what I mean? You know, blues rock kind of clubs and, you know, just all sorts of kind of different venues. So that's, that's really a lot of fun. I don't remember uh, when I met John Schofield. Or, to my recollection, the first time I met him was when he was playing with Miles Davis. I have a great deal of respect for his playing. I mean, he's such an interesting player. He's got such a unique way of phrasing, and just his note choices are so, so, are so fresh. And what he comes up with, his ideas are so, you know, that uh, he's, so, he's a, such a unique player. I mean, I can recognize him right away just with, with a few notes, you know. He's got such a strong identity as a player. You know, I mean, he uses every aspect of his instrument, you know, the, the lines that he's playing and the, and the chords and stuff. 
but the sounds and the way he integrates the different sounds he uses with what he's playing, and it's just, uh, you know, it's kind of the way I think things should be going, in, in my opinion, you know, just the, kind of the way he's, the direction he's going. The last time I saw him prior to the other night was uh, this trio he has with Jack DeJohnette and uh, Larry Goldings, which is another great experience. <laughs> Schofield, Modesky, Martin, and Wood, and uh, I think in terms of the uh, the range of what we presented here, uh, if you have Frank Morgan, who, who uh, you know played with Lionel Hampton in the 40s, if you have him on this side, then you'd have to probably have Modesky, Martin, and Wood here on the other side of the range of what we presented. And so, um, you know, some of the people who weren't familiar with their music were like, "Whoa, what is this? You know, this is this is a little bit beyond me." You know, and um, but I was really happy to be able to present that to them because I really wanted people to see what's going on in the jazz world, you know, what's happening and what kind of music is current now. And uh, so I think that although they might not have been able to completely appreciate it, you know, when they hear the music again, it'll be a slow awareness that they'll develop and uh, it won't be so far into them next time. These guys are always seem to me to be pushing the limits in a lot of different ways and they're combining a lot of different musical elements, you know. And that's an atmosphere that I'm really comfortable in because I don't think the music has to be rigid. I don't believe there's one way to do it, you know, that this is right, this is jazz, this is authentic jazz, and that's not authentic jazz, whatever that means, you know. I mean, there's always going to be some argument about that, you know, and I guess that's just the nature of the music and the nature of the people that listen to the music and, you know, have a sense of what they think the music is or should be.
Looking forward to playing with David Sanborn. It's a long history together, man. When I met David Sanborn, I was 19. I had braces on my teeth, man, you know? <laughs> I've known him a very long time, and uh, I've written so much music for him and produced many albums for him. But we haven't been working together in the last five or six years, so it's gonna be nice to get together and play with Dave again. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do yet, but um, you know, he's been into doing a little bit more jazzy stuff. Uh, Roy Hargrove is gonna be there, and he has two sides. He has his straight ahead side, and then he has a group he calls the RH Factor. He's gonna be there twice. First time he's gonna be there with his group, who plays more like a straight ahead jazz. And then the next day, he's gonna play some of the RH Factor music with my group. That's gonna be really cool, particularly because two of the guys in my band, uh, Bobby Sparks, the keyboard player, and Keith Anderson, the sax player, they used to play with Roy Hargrove, so they know all his stuff anyway. So it's gonna be really like a family thing, you know, with David Sanborn and, and Roy Hargrove, and everybody kind of knows each other. It's gonna be really nice.